How are you all doing this morning? Oh, you're all chipper? That's awesome. Hey, uh, one thing before I get going. My name is Jason, and I am one of the pastors here at the Open Door, and I am just want to welcome you all here. Man, there's a bunch of visitors here, so welcome here. If you were a visitor here, if it's your first time, or you're visiting family here, I hope you're welcomed at the door. I hope you felt very warm and welcome, but if not, from me to you, welcome here. Glad you could join us. Uh, I had a couple of questions. So, um, I read about an interesting uh, event this week. Actually, I read about many interesting events this week, to be honest. But one of them that really caught my mind, uh, there, there's this ship. And I actually didn't know what a roll-on, roll-off ship was. Uh, does anybody know what a roll-on, roll-off ship is? I'm actually curious. I hear what you have to say afterwards. So a roll-on, roll-off ship is, is, is essentially, if you think of a semi-truck and a loading dock. You know, you, you, you have the, the loading dock is like the, usually concrete. Uh, it, it drops out so that there's a, a platform, the floor of your manufacturing plant or your, your warehouse, whatever, comes even with the floor of your, your, your semi-truck. And then you can just literally drive a forklift onto your, your truck trailer and you can drop stuff off and, draw, and, and come back in. That's what a roll-on, roll-off ship does. It's actually a ship designed with a big open bottom. You can see if you that, that next slide there, uh, Jacob. It's, it's a big ship. And then you see the ship on the left side, and that giant door is, is like the door of a semi-truck and makes its own loading ramp, and you can literally roll on and roll off huge cargo. So what you're seeing there is an Atlas V, the, the first stage of an Atlas V rocket booster. Uh, they're huge, absolutely huge. And the Delta Mariner, which is pictured there, is a roll-on, roll-off cargo ship. And, and it's amazing. The way it's designed, it actually doesn't sit very deep in the water, so this goes up river systems. I mean, they have to be dredged somewhat, whatever. But you, know, you can actually see this thing trudging down the river systems. And the Delta Mariner has been around for, for decades. Uh, and, and it primarily has gone up and down the Kentucky River system between uh, Aerodyne, or, uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne, who makes Atlas V rocket parts, and, and some of the launch pads and secondary maintenance uh, facilities. And so it just basically ferries Atlas V rockets up and down the Kentucky River system, which is... Kind of, a, kind of a bizarre idea that you have these big rockets floating down the river. I mean, the rockets, you think they can fly, right? But no, they float down the river. Well, so January 26 in 2012, the, the, the Delta Mariner was traveling down the Kentucky River system. And it was heading down through Lake Kentucky by, by a bridge called Agner's Ferry Bridge. And, and as it was approaching, it was night, it was about 11 o'clock, it was pitch black, you know, light fog. Uh, they were beginning to wonder where they were supposed to pass under a bridge. You see, they had the, the captain on deck, they had the first mate on deck, and then they also had uh, their third mate, which was their navigator, plus they had hired on two special trained expert river navigators who understand where all of the little like rocks in the river are, where you want to avoid, what the bridge heights all are, and stuff. So they had, they had a well-stocked crew. Uh, and of course, they're, they're, they're hauling expensive cargo. So the Delta Mariner has all the latest GPS and radio contact and everything else. But as they were approaching the bridge, something was, was off because most of the bridge span was dark. And, and these bridges are usually well lit, so you can see where you're supposed to pass, where the piers are, and, and, and where the, the heights of the span were. And so the captain, who wasn't actually on duty, he was just sitting uh, in, on the bridge, the bridge of the ship, not the bridge of the bridge, made a comment that that looked awfully low, that bridge. Well, that, of course, causes a whole lot of confusion, I mean, and they want to talk this through because you want to be sure before you pass under a bridge that you know exactly what you're doing. And so the river navigators looked through all their notes and the details and, and, and pulled out all the Coast Guard information, and, and it was quite clear that we're, there, there were some green lights, three green lights over one span, that you're supposed to head under the lights. That was very clear in the literature, and, and, and yet they weren't 100% sure, so they, they got some of the deckhands to grab the big spotlights on top of the Delta Mariner and shine it along the bridge, and they made sure where the piers were on the bridge, where the deck was, and yeah, that was where they were supposed to pass, and everything was good. And so the captain and the first mate and the second mate navigator and the expert bridge navigators and the GPS and the radio and the spotlight and the deckhands, they all agreed, we going where the green lights on that bridge were. Now, uh, the Kentucky Highway Transportation Services... Uh, had noticed that a couple of lights were out on the bridge. That, that of course, obviously the captain had noticed. And so they had uh, put out a work order. And the next morning at, at 9 o'clock, there was a crew coming to replace the giant white lights that tell cargo ships where to go, as opposed to the green lights that tell the recreational boats where to go. But this was 11 o'clock the night before. So you can imagine the surprise when the boat suddenly shuddered and a giant span of deck fell off of the bridge and fell onto the deck of the boat. And you want to show that next picture? That's what a bridge looks like when a boat hits it. That's an accident. 
That's a $2.6 million accident that closes a major highway for two and a half months. That's a massive whoops. The Coast Guard and the, uh, and the um, Marine River Service Transportation Authorities held, held a giant review to figure out what happened. And they interviewed everybody involved. And they determined that the experts had all of the knowledge needed. They determined that the GPS was working perfectly functionally. They determined that uh, all of the course of action that the entire crew made was the proper set of action. The only cause, the, the primary and by far the largest cause of the accident was that there was no observable lighthouse or light fixture to guide them in this treacherous bridge pass. That was it. And then this is understandable, because you see, the thing about this is, everybody, whether it's, it's your, your GPS and your maps and your compass and everything, is part of this boat, this moving boat. And, and, and all of the experts and all of the advice and all the understanding, the captain and the first mate and your river navigators and your deckhands are all on the boat. And so all of the information is on the boat, but the treacherous waters are up ahead. And there was no unmoving fixed point of guidance. Everything was happening in real time as this boat hurtles down the river with a rocket engine inside. And so it was deemed that, that this would solely have been solved if there had been a lighthouse, a pier light, or a bridge light shining properly, denoting where to travel. And this isn't surprising. When waters get treacherous, when currents move, when, when winds howl, when weather is bad, that's when you need a lighthouse. You don't need a lighthouse when things are clear and obvious and easy. You need a lighthouse where there's hidden reefs, things that, that everybody thinks look safe. When you, when you have 30-foot rocks jutting out of the ocean, boats don't hit that. It's when you have giant rocks two feet below the surface that boats hit that. I've been on more than one motorboat in, in Stephenfield Lake that's smoked. I guess it's about the same rock. It seems to be the same area. It looks like all the rest of Stephenfield Lake, and then you go over top of it, and then you have to buy a new motor, or a new propeller seems to happen. It's the rocks just below the surface that get you. That's where you need the warning. Because all of human wisdom and understanding and electronics and fail in certain areas of life. Now, we are facing a time of very polarized issues. Very, very polarized, hot topic issues facing the church. It seems like, like, like a, a wave of them. And, and what happens is, and I don't know what you do if you're not a believer. I mean, I, I honestly don't know what you do if you're not a Christian because you have media outlets and you have uh, one media outlet saying one thing, one media outlet, outlet doing the exact same information, saying the opposite thing. And, and I don't know how you, how you piece it together. I mean, I honestly don't know. You have, you have politicians who are guiding in one direction or another direction. And I don't know if you're not a believer how you actually decide who's telling the truth and who's not. You've got economists looking at the same data and saying that one thing is financially sound or the exact opposite is financially sound. And I don't know how you are supposed to decide if you're not a believer. Because I don't know what your lighthouse is. I don't know how you can have a lighthouse. If you believe that all there is is a boat and the people on it, and the skills, and the experts, and the scientists, and the media on the boat, I don't know how you decide where the boat's supposed to go. But I'm a believer. And so I want to ask the question today, what as believers are we supposed to do? How are we as believers supposed to approach these contentious issues? What's our lighthouse supposed to be? Now, I believe, and I'm going to actually just give you the answer right off the top, because I think this is going to be fairly obvious in a Sunday school preachy kind of answer sort of way, that the, that the lighthouse for a believer is what God said in his word, what Jesus did when he lived, and what the Holy Spirit speaks to us today. That is the, the, the trinity of lighthouse that is for us how we're supposed to navigate these waters. What God said in his word, what Jesus did, and what the Holy Spirit speaks to us now. And, and those three things, I also believe, will be in perfect unity. They'll never conflict or contradict each other. And together, they will guide us into how to handle these issues. But here's the thing. I'm going to pick one issue today. I'm going to pick the least contentious issue. I'm going to pick immigration and refugees, because that's totally obvious, and we all agree on it. As a test case today, your laughter totally encourages me. <laughs> As a test case. And here's what we're going to do. I'm not going to give a single piece of economic data. I'm not going to give a single piece of information on security, numbers up or down. I'm not going to give a single piece of information, media, or political statement as far as how this makes sense to Canadian values. 
I am not going to look at any of that. And I'm not going to say that that's not useful, and that shouldn't be part of a conversation, that shouldn't guide some of our policies. Or, or any, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, ultimately, as a believer, I don't know how we can do anything but look at the lighthouses of our faith. I don't know how we can put our trust in other people who are on the same boat as us. When, when, when I go to an issue and go, as a human being, I don't think we can understand this issue. I don't know why I would go and look at other human beings who are in the same boat as me trying to understand this issue and go, well, they've probably got it all figured out. See, because here's what happens. Spoiler alert. We find the people who say what we're feeling must be true. We find the people who agree with us. We find the people who, who really promote those, those inner feelings we have and give some political catchphrase or economic data or numbers about security, and we agree with it, issue by issue. And if you're not a believer, I actually don't have anything to say to you. I, I, I guess good luck. I, I really honestly don't know. But if you are a believer, or if you're curious about what it means to actually follow Jesus, I'm going to say we're going to have to look at what Jesus actually did, what God actually said, what the Holy Spirit is currently saying to us, and use that as our lighthouse. Because here's the thing. Being a Christian isn't putting on nice clothes and coming to church on a Sunday. Christian actually means Christ-like, Christ-follower. And so ultimately, you're a Christian if you follow Christ. Otherwise, you're a suit and a chair on a Sunday morning. And so today, we're actually going to look at one really contentious issue that many of you will probably disagree with many other people on today. And we're going to look at one thing. What does the lighthouse say? Why are we going to do this? Because personally, I'd rather not. I honestly would rather not. Romans 12, verse 2. Paul says it. He says, guys, 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 guys. Do not be conformed to this age. Don't fit the patterns of this age. Don't follow the boat. The boat looks right. Don't follow the boat. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? So that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. So we learn a few pieces of information right here. Number one, God has a will. God has an opinion. God actually wants something to happen. Number two, this age doesn't know what that is. We see it right here. This is it's a simple verse. You can write this up, put this on your fridge. God has a will. Our culture does not know what that will is. Occasionally, the culture happens to get it right, but don't count on it. Number two, this is what Jesus said. He says, guys, listen, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Again, God has a will. Not everybody who talks the talk actually gets the kingdom of heaven, but only those who does that will. So God has a will. Our culture doesn't know what that will is, but as Christians, we're called to walk in it. Not perfectly. I will be the first to admit not perfectly, but that has to be our guiding principle. Last time I was talking about the difference between Saul and David, and I talked about David, even when he screwed up, was a man after God's heart, and Saul was a man who, as long as it was clearly spelled out, did it, but as soon as there was any vagary, just did whatever he felt like, just whatever kind of the cultural thing told him to do. We're talking about this again. God has a will. The lighthouse is actually saying something. We're called to live different. And so I'm not going to talk about economic, political, security, Canadian values. I, I'm literally just going to look at a lighthouse. So what does the lighthouse say? Well, if you're not a Christian, I'm not sure. But if you are a Christian, we can go back to the Old Testament. Now, the Old Testament, especially the, the first five books of the Bible... Um, in Leviticus here where I'm going to be going. It's God talking to a people who've been stuck in slavery for hundreds of years, don't understand really the first thing about who God is, and he's trying to hammer them in a, in a desert culture surrounded by enemies and scorpions and snakes and, and idol worshiping, and he's trying to hammer them, and a lot of it's very direct, and it, it, it's kind of harsh because he's really trying to shape and pull out and root out some of these bad behaviors they had. So you find a lot of very harsh commandments in, in, in uh, some of the Older Testament parts of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. I'm going to go to Leviticus here and see what God has to say, what one part of the lighthouse says about this. It says, well, when a foreigner lives with you in your land, you must not oppress him. You, in fact, you must regard the foreigner who lives with you as the native born among you. You are to love him as yourself. For you were foreigners in the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh your God. 
So however you love your son or daughter is how you should love the foreigner's son or daughter. And how you care for your brother is how you should love your foreigner brother. That's clear about some stuff, kind of vague about how that's actually supposed to look, I'll admit. We can go a little further in 1 Kings. It says, so, so even for the foreigner, foreigner who is not of your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, for they will hear of your great name. God, you're so great, and you will bless us so mightily. Other people will hear of your name, your mighty hand, an outstretched arm, and will come. So we're not the first people to have uh, immigrants and refugees sneaking across the border and coming into Emerson. Well, Emerson might be a specific detail that we have uniquely, but this has happened throughout all of culture. God blesses a people. Other people who do not have it so blessed come. So what happens? They will come and pray towards this temple. May you hear in heaven, God, listen and love them, your dwelling place, and do according to all the foreigner asks for you, asks you for rather. Then all the people on earth will know your name to fear you as your people Israel do and know that this temple I have built is called by your name. Now here's something that's not directly stated, but I'm going to say is pretty clearly stated. What it's not saying is, God, when they pray to you, when they come to our land and pray to you, do as they ask, because we're not going to. It's saying, God, do as they ask. Your will be done. And then also encourage us to pray to heaven, to God, not my will, but your will be done. We are supposed to be part of that will of God. God has a will. God has an opinion. God has a plan. And he calls us to be a part of it. In case there's any vagary, we can go to Numbers 15. It says, The assembly is to have the same statute, same rule, same law, for both you and the foreign resident. There should be no difference between the permanent Israeli living in the desert and the foreigner who joins up later. There should be no difference. Same law. As a permanent statute throughout the generations, you and the foreigner will be alike before the Lord. And here's what I do not believe that it's saying. You should be alike before the Lord, but go ahead and be different in the land. If we're supposed to be a Christian nation, a Christian people, a Christian church, if we're alike before the Lord, we're alike before each other. If we're brothers before the Lord, we're brothers before each other. If we're sons of God, we're sons of each other. The same law and the same ordinances will apply to both you and the foreigner who reside with you. I have read this a lot. A lot. I have looked through this a lot. And I'm not asking you to like this. I'm not even asking myself to like everything that I read in the Bible. I'm just saying, if I claim to be a Christ follower, I kind of have to follow Christ. This is my lighthouse. This has to be my lighthouse. And I don't know what this all looks like practically always. But if I'm not heading for this, I'm probably heading for a bridge. This is what I see. This isn't a liberal idea or a pleasant thought or a fine in principle, but what are we supposed to do in real life sort of thing. This is what the lighthouse says. So, so here's the question. Let's get a little more practical. So what are we supposed to do if someone comes to our country and they don't speak our language and they don't understand our culture and they don't get the way we do things and they don't get a job and... We don't relate well with them right away. What are we supposed to do? Because I, I hear a lot about, uh, and I'm going to get really specific about some issues, because this is what's this in the news. We're all reading this. We're all reading the same news uh, about, about Canadian values tests or something like that. If you don't get a high enough score, send them on back. I was going to get some pictures of some of the cities and towns and countries where people left, but I... I don't know if it's fit to show in church some of the horrors that people have left. This is what the Bible has to say. This is Deuteronomy. This is God speaking. This is really clear God speaking. I can't get around this. I, I can dance and I can Greek and Hebrew you all I want. This is plain. Do not return a slave to his master when he has escaped from his master to you. Let him live among you wherever he wants within your gates. Do not mistreat him. If someone runs away from a bad master, don't send him back. What does that mean? Like, how many millions of people do we have to take in? I don't know. I don't have a number for you. I, I, I'm not a politician. I'm not a policymaker. I'm not a 
the economist, and you know what? We actually need politicians and policymakers and economists to help us guide some of these questions. I'm just saying, this is my lighthouse. This is where I need to head. Don't send them back. I, I literally, I don't know how I can read that and get anything other than don't send them back. If you can, feel free to talk to me later and explain it to me. But I, I read this a thousand times this week. I don't know how to interpret this. The lighthouse is clear. Don't send them back. Will this be hard? I imagine this would be very hard. Will this affect standards of living? I imagine it probably does. Would God bless us for it? I imagine so, but I can't even promise you that. That's what my lighthouse says. Now, I've got a daughter. I've got a wife. I've got a house. I would be bold-faced lying if I didn't say that security doesn't come into my mind sometimes. I'd be lying to you if I didn't say that security, when it comes to me living like 25 minutes from the border and a wave of random people coming across the border, that security doesn't ever enter my mind. And you know what? If you're not a believer, then, I mean, security can be a god. Security can be a lighthouse. I, I absolutely imagine it can be. I don't think I'm allowed to let that happen for me. Back in the Old Testament, Ezekiel was talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, but he was also prophesying about our time. And that happens a lot in the Bible. The, 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 the great prophets of the Old Testament, they would be talking about something in the past, but they're actually talking about something that's coming forward in the future. And he talks about, and, he, and he's, he's, Ezekiel's standing there, and he's accusing Sodom and Gomorrah, and he's speaking to the future of Israel and the future of God's people and the future of the church. And he's asking rhetorically, what was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? And he says, now this, now this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom, your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, plenty of food, and comfortable security, but didn't support the poor and needy. Will this affect our security? I imagine. But here, here's, the, here's the, the conceit. Here's the fallacy that we fall into. And I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking at you. I'm speaking to myself as well as anybody else. We believe we're responsible for our security. We've done well. We live by law and order. We have security. And now other people come and want to threaten that security. Here's the reality. We don't. We don't have security. We didn't make security. We don't have control over security. We are blessed by God. It is a good gift. Every good and perfect gift comes from God including our security. And he blessed us with money, with security, with food, with plenty to eat for a reason. Will this affect our security? Probably. And I'm picking one issue. You can unpack any contentious issue you want to do. I'm just picking on one right now because it's a hot topic. It's on everybody's mind. I'm just saying, here's Ezekiel saying, Sodom's problem, they had money, they had food, they had security, and they just tried to keep it for themselves. That's convicting to me. That hurts me. I'm not saying this isn't something I wrestle with. I'm saying this is something I have to wrestle with. This is my lighthouse. Malachi, another prophet of the Old Testament. 3 verses 5. He's speaking on behalf of God. And he's talking about God's judgment. And he says, I will come to you in judgment. And he says, God says, and I will be ready to witness against sorcerers. Well, witchcraft seems like a bad thing. And adulterers. Cheating spouses seems like a bad thing. Against those who lie, who swear falsely. Against those who oppress the widows and the fatherless. Man, people who take advantage of widows and fatherless children, they're jerks. Cheat the wage earner. People who hold back wages, they're jerks. And against those who deny justice to the foreigner. If we as a culture had white out, which part would we white out? It says, they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. This is convicting. I'm not lying. If I, if I say I'm a Christ follower, though, don't I have to follow Christ? So... One thing I have seen when people have been talking about this issue a lot and hearing and we should probably pick the nicest, most skilled, able to work 
the quickest, most Christian or Christian-y people, because they're the most like us, bring them into our, cult- our, our, our country so we don't corrupt or water down our Canadian values. Now, just on a purely human level, um, our Canadian values, our country was actually built on accepting refugees and immigrants. I, I'm fourth generation refugee immigrants. Most of you don't have to go back further than three, four, or five generations, so you're refugees and immigrants too. So that is actually part of our Canadian values. That, that's just, I said I wasn't going to get into human arguments, but it slipped out by accident. Also in my notes, but that's fine. Shouldn't we just accept those who are the closest like us so we don't take on too much risk? What's our lighthouse? What does God say? What did Jesus do? What's the Holy Spirit saying us to us currently? Well, this is what Jesus said in, in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. He's talking to people who are following him. They're following him, but they're still wrestling with how to follow him. And Jesus says, well, guys, if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Look, if you're just some non-Christian politician, yeah, that's actually, that's kind of a good middle ground. Let's accept some people, but let's make sure they're very much like us. I mean, that totally, totally in a logical world makes sense. But then again, there was a captain and a first mate and a second mate and two river operators who were trained in navigation and a searchlight and a GPS and a bunch of river charts and they smoked a bridge that was right in front of them. I know this makes logical sense, but... I tell you what, guys, I'm going with the lighthouse. I don't know how else to navigate. I don't know how else to tell you to navigate. I don't know how else to guide us to navigate. I would be lying if I didn't say that I wrestled with how to present this this week. Because it was like a month ago, month and a half ago that I decided to speak on it this week. And the closer we got, the more I'm like, this is a harsh message. This really is like a slap with a two by four on the face and the first thing in the morning. I, I know that for many of us, this makes us very uncomfortable. And then God led me to Proverbs 31, 8 verses 9. It says, speak up for those who have no voice. For the justice of all who are dispossessed. That means landless. That means not having a nation of their own. Speak up for those. Speak up, judge righteously, and defend the cause of the oppressed and needy. I don't know how to do anything else. I'm not smart enough to fix this issue. I'm not smart enough to give you a wonderful opinion or a great idea. I'm not clever enough to unpack the economics. I'm not researched enough to give you policies. I literally have no choice but to go to what the lighthouse says and be a fair and honest reporter of it. And I I look and I can't find a single thing God said or Jesus did or the Holy Spirit is guiding us now that says anything other than that we should be caring for those who have no land, those who are hurt, those who have escaped a harsh master, those who have come to us because of our blessings and our security and our finances, and that we should care for them. And I fully invite you. In fact, this is my challenge. I'm going to invite the band to come up in a few seconds. But this is my challenge to you. Do your own research. Do your own reading. Do your own praying. Do your own seeking. I, I challenge you openly and honestly. This isn't a fake rhetorical challenge. I'm saying dive in. And if you have any disagreement with anything I have said today, I want to invite you. In fact, I say, please come and talk to me. But I warn you, if you're going to come talk to me, only, only talk about lighthouses. Only. If you come and talk to me this week and you say, but that makes me uncomfortable, or that's going to hurt our taxes, or that's scary, I'll say probably yes, and I don't care. If you can come to me and you can say, no, you're completely misinterpreting these verses or you've completely misinterpreted the way Jesus act or whatever, or even slightly. And if you have that, that's my challenge to you. Come and talk to me. And I tell you what, I will repent before you all. I don't think so. But I'm open. 
But when I'm praying about this, all I've, and I've prayed for years, I've asked God, you know, break my heart for what breaks yours. I didn't expect this when I prayed that, but I've got no choice but to walk honestly in it and challenge all of us to walk honestly in it. And I know it's easy at the coffee shop to say what feels good, and I know it's easy on Facebook to repost what feels good, and I know it's easy to just, you're not actually face-to-face with anybody who's in poverty to just say what we feel. But my deeper challenge is, what does the lighthouse say? Because I think our culture is heading for a bridge. I think our country is heading down a very dark path. And I'm sad about it. I'm, I'm not surprised because if, if you're not believers, if, if you're led by non-believers in a country of largely non-believers, I don't really expect anything other than them to look at what's on the boat. But we're called to live differently, to not conform to this age. So I, I, I encourage you, dig, dig in for yourselves. See what's there. Allow God to challenge you however he wants to challenge you with no with no bias as you enter in. I invite you to bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, just just honestly. God, this is just one hard, dark, complicated issue of of dozens. And God, I, I fully admit it is hard to wrestle with following you culture that seems to be so opposed to following you and we just want to come before you right now God and just just admit we don't know our way God we're we're as lost as the rest of our culture except for one thing God we believe we have faith and we trust that that you will guide us into all truths as you said you would in our Bible Lord God you've, you've implanted Find the seed of your Holy Spirit inside of us, God. And I ask right now, and I pray in your name, and I, and I beg before the throne room of God that you would grow that seed in us today. Lord God, that where there's, where there's a whole culture screaming in one direction, Lord God, that you would roar like a lion louder in each of our hearts. This is the way, walk in it. Lord God, where we're wrong, I just pray you would rebuke us. Lord God, where we're brave, I pray you would add steel to our spines. Lord God, where we walk in your truth, I pray you would bless us mightily. That all culture, all countries, and all this world would see that when you follow God's principles, you are well and truly blessed. And Lord God, I just pray right now that where there are hurting and dispossessed people, you would send them to us as you promised you would. Lord God, I pray you would equip us, you would bless us, you would resource us so that we can handle the wave of need you would send to us in this time. And as surely as Canada rose up when there was tsunamis around the world wiping out other people in other countries, I pray we would rise up for the human tsunami of need that approaches us. That we would not be washed away in it, but that we would receive it and we would be blessed for receiving it well. Lord God, I pray all of this in your precious and holy name. Amen. You know, thank you, Jason. I know for me, I don't have a TV, cable, or satellite at home. I don't get a newspaper.